Hello and welcome to another edition of the Coach and Benway podcast. This is the weekly bile for Saturday, October 13th, 2018. I'm Coach Redpill, joined as always by my co-host, Dr. Benway. And uh, we're going to be talking about, uh, you know, things are looking up roses if you're a Republican and l- looking up like shit if you're a Democrat. Because, uh, you know, the, the word of the week, I think, is mob. Uh, so, good Dr. Benway, uh, as always, it's a pleasure being with you, so why don't you fill us in about why the mainstream media is so afraid of the word mob? Because it's accurate and it's effective. I mean, that's there's nothing more to it than that. Uh, this was the week, arguably, that the GOP found a piece of its backbone and decided to rebuild it, uh, right? So, obviously, we all know at this point that Justice Brett Kavanaugh, and I stress the word justice, came onto the Supreme Court. Uh, From all intents and purposes, he is sufficiently and strongly on the right wing of the court, both literally and metaphorically. And so we're happy with that outcome. What's interesting, though, is obviously the left's response to the situation is typical to every time they lose. Uh, They deploy a hissy fit and it's hard to start smashing everything, start saying that, Oh, you know, well, because we lost this last battle, this last thing that we lost over, it should be gotten rid of. So the Supreme Court and judicial review needs to go just like the Electoral College had to go just like, uh, uh, you know, equal representation amongst the states as opposed to um, uh, proportional representation by population had to go. You know, everything that kind of works against them suddenly is, you know, worthy of the shaft. Yeah. And frankly, every congressman and every senator who is against them should be attacked and and demeaned. And so the Republicans realized what Trump gave them the lead on, which was to say, hey, this is just a fucking mob. Yeah. Do you really want to be led by a mob? And the reason you're Don Lemons and everybody else is freaking out about it is because they know it's an effective strategy. Yeah. The GOP came up with a new ad. It debuted yesterday and it was uh, simple and powerful. It was just clips of the Democrats having a hissy fit. And they look like, um, uh, you know, charitably, they look like uh, tantrumy children. Uncharitably, they look like uh, crazy people. It was more sophisticated than that. It's actually a, a very intelligent whoever did it. Yeah. They took, the, they, and it was a pattern that they followed. And I think they need to do more of it and they need to up the ante. But they took a notable Democratic congressperson or senator or politician, had them saying, something you know some ridiculous call to extremism and then the crowd actually acting upon it so it starts off with eric holder saying when they go low we kick them and then it cuts to that guy the anti uh the antifa guy kicking and the abortion the anti uh abortion -abortion protester uh kicking the anti-abortion uh film recording girl in the face essentially Mm. then it cuts to um, you know, Maxine uh, Waters, James Brown, James Brown in with tits saying, you know, you, you know, if you see a Republicans in public, you form a crowd and you, you know, piss at them and yell at them and say, you're not welcome. Then they cut to Ted Cruz being chased out of the restaurant. Then yeah. they have Hillary Clinton saying, you can't be civil with people who are against everything you believe in. And then it shows the fucking mob pounding on the doors of the Supreme Court. It's more than just saying the left is a mob. It's saying the, you know, monkey see, monkey do the lead. It's a rot from the top down. Yeah. And it's very clear. So this is much more sophisticated than just saying, oh, look at them being nasty. Now, I think them being nasty is useful. And I think the next step should be, okay, we showed you the nastiness they exhibit to members of Congress and the institutions. Let me show you what they do to MAGA supporters. Let me show you, you know, pulling a MAGA guy out of his car and getting beat down. Let me show you all the times they throw shit and piss at everybody. Because that's you, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that they they seem to be on track. But, you know, you never know with the Republicans, you know. You never know with the RNC. Because sometimes I'm convinced that the RNC leadership is, you know, controlled opposition. Because they, they have this habit of fucking it up when they're, you know, snatching defeat from the jaws of victory. You know what I mean? It's just it will because we have, uh, like most political parties, multiple tendencies. And unlike the Democrats, whose middling or middle group moderate tendency got, you know, thrashed, eviscerated, sidelined, yeah. our moderate tendency, the neoconservatives, for good or ill, well, obviously for ill, 
are still lingering in bits of power. We haven't completely expunged the number of Trumpers, even though they have no real sway amongst the populace. Yeah, but they're in the levers of power and they cause trouble. And well, fortunately, you know, unfortunately, one less, they, one less of one those. less, <laughs> one less uh, in the aftermath of the Brett Kavanaugh hearing, which, by the way, she said, oh, we have to listen and believe to Ford. Of course, she said that. She, uh, you know the uh, you We're know the extra about Nikki Haley, by the way, of, of for the audience. Haley, you, you know, yeah, the, the audience is smart enough; they know who it is. Um, yeah, she left, you know, with good fanfare, and I kept track of all of the so-called Republicans on our side who were crying over this. <laughs> ben Shapiro, obviously, because mm-hmm. she, you know, it's she's his spirit animal. In other words, it's his masturbation plush toy. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> Anna, what Annabelle Stuckey or whatever her fucking name is, basically the uh, the whole CRTV crowd, including uh, you know what is it? Uh, Roaming Millennial was also kind of teary eyed about it. These are the people you have to watch out for. These are the people who really don't have our interests at heart, who make uh, bed with people who have yeah. more or less the policies that we're fighting against. Don't trust them. Yeah, Keep they're an eye on they're them. rhinos, Republican in name only, or they're they're basically neocon shills, which basically means that they don't care about anything except the greater good and glory of some foreign state as opposed to the United States. Yeah, I I, I despise all of those people. And um, yes, you're absolutely right. The fact that they were all crying over Nikki Haley is only like a, like a, like an endorsement to her being. Was she fired or did she leave on her own? What's the um, what's the over under on that question? Uh, from what I gather, people think there's a story behind it. They just don't know what it is. Mm. Uh, so nobody's really accepting her face value of, oh, I just, you know, you know, did my service and want to call an end to it. She's not that type. I, no. you know, so it could go either way. Either she wants to run against the president, which is the fearful that would be insane. You have. Or insane. alternatively, alternatively, uh, it's because there's some interest in investigating some benefits she received about flying on private jets and a few other little perks that go above and beyond comfortable ethics for mm. her position. So that could be part of it. Truth of the matter is, I just fundamentally don't know, but I suspect there's something, and I think that's as best as we can say right now. Well, notable developments, uh, political developments, was that in the confirmation ceremony of Judge Kavanaugh, you know, Trump was there and he he read a pre pre written script. You know, he deviated it from it very little, but the noticeable deviations, uh, or, or not deviations, the little emphases that he made were on uh, Lindsey Graham and Mitch McConnell. He singled them both out, and he had Mitch McConnell stand up and get a round of applause, and everybody stood up for him. And so I, I think that two things happened. Number one, Mitch McConnell is the bell of the ball. I mean, he really delivered on the Kavanaugh situation. Uh, and, and, you know, he handled that just right. And um, clearly he is now be fully behind Trump, which is interesting. And Lindsey Graham, is, is he grew a backbone. It, it must have been the nefarious influence of, um, you know, uh, uh, Satan's spawn, i.e. John McCain. You know that um, yeah, John McCain's death, freedom from the witch's spell. Yeah, yeah that's in theory. Uh, this to me, this is all conditional because the key element of the Trump policy that they've yet to touch with a ten foot pole is immigration. At the very least, funding of the wall, or even l- more least than that, um, fighting against this stupid amnesty proposal. These guys, I still don't know what they're ultimately going to do. They may delay. Uh, it's certainly, I'm happy to get the victory that we do have, uh, but it's always conditional for me with well, these guys. Well, the, 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 the problem and the, and um, the, the problem of a kleptocracy as we have, and um, kleptocracy is the one where, where the rich people rule, right? Or, or well, anyway, the, the problem of such a state is that, see, you know, you're never quite sure why a political party or political movement is doing something and if there are moneyed interests behind it. My thinking is that a lot of Republicans don't really want to touch the immigration thing because a lot of businesses depend on illegal immigration or the the easy peasy immigration that we currently have. I mean, all of Silicon Valley, and everybody knows this, depends on H-1B-1 visas because they import the uh, engineers, the software engineers, and pay them a fraction of the price. 
And these uh, immigrants are, for all intents and purposes, indentured servants because their visas in the United States depend on the, uh, on the good graces of their employer. The second their employer doesn't like them anymore and fires them, they, they uh, go through a process of essentially losing their visa unless the heroic measures are undertaken, basically. So th these, these workers, mostly South Asian, i.e. from India and Pakistan, these programmers are brought in and they are worked like, really like indentured servants, not to say slaves. And they're at the mercy of their employer and they get paid a, a fraction of what an American software engineer would be paid. And therefore, all these companies pay a lot of money to the political parties to keep this immigration regime going. Now, the question becomes, will their principles and, and the populist anger at this reach a point where it, it nullifies the moneyed interests who benefit from immigration? I don't know. I mean, what do you think? Well, I don't think that the GOP right now has demonstrated where it's going to go one way or the other on this, frankly. Uh, as to what the public thinks about you know, th all of these pieces of the immigration puzzle, as soon as you start articulating it in all these complicated puzzles, they you know just know how crowds react. It's too complicated for them to pay attention. To. Yeah. So, do, are they going to get hissy over the H one B one visa? In abstract, potentially. In reality, no. No, no. Yeah, I know. But the issue becomes: when is the Republicans going to? put something on the table. You figure that Trump might save it as sort of like a last minute October surprise, like here, I have delivered the wall, you know, right before. The I, would have, I mean, I, I mean, it's, I don't know ultimately what he's going to do on that front. It's been the biggest piece of his campaign promise. That's a gap to this point in yeah. time. So I don't know what's ultimately going to happen to it. I think the Republicans would at this point would clearly prefer to eke out a victory without it. I think it's possible that they could, but I think it's a dangerous gambit. We'll see. Uh, I do think, however, as of where they're standing now, they're in a much better position than they were about a mm -hmm. month ago oh, in yeah. terms of their potential performance on the ballot. Yeah. Uh, the Democratic enthusiasm is still high, but it's not higher. And the Republican enthusiasm has grown. Mm which is a, a positive element to this because the Republicans realized that to our point earlier, the left is acting kind of freaky. Yeah. Right. In a very public way. And in a way, as I said, it's top down They have Hillary Clinton sl coming out of her slug hole <laughs> with the slimy trail behind her coming into public eye, eye, eye again and saying, Oh, we can't be civil with these bad people until we take control of the, yeah. of the Congress. Basically she's holding the country hostage. Like she's been doing since the day she did not get elected. The, she did the exact same thing that Trump, she accused Trump of doing, which was, Hey, you know, you won't respect the outcome of the election. This is a pivotal piece of our blah, 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 blah. And she continues two years later to play this game. I say when someone punches her in the face and knocks her over into a cement mixture and she gets locked into whatever street corner she ultimately falls into, your response can only be to say, well, it's hard to be civil with, with someone who stands against all the fundamental values that you have. Yeah. 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 Anyway. Um, okay. So, so there was that, there was, um, the, the ad, um, oh, and there was that purge on Facebook. You hear about that? Oh, there's always some fucking purge on Facebook. I mean, no, but yes, I know everything probably there is to know about it. No, no, no. This time they really took a whack. They they wiped out 600 um, uh, Facebook pages and accounts. And uh, and some of them were really big. I mean, like millions of, of followers or subscribers or whatever they have on Facebook. I don't follow Facebook, so I don't really know. Um, they got rid of all those guys. Um, and and the thing is, the, the hit came on, interestingly enough, mostly left-wing pages. And that was kind of surprising because at first, you know, on our side, we saw only the right wingers get, get hit because there were right wingers who got hit, uh, quite a few. But a lot of, the, I mean, the majority of the 600 who got purged were left wingers. So that's kind of bizarre. I don't know. Yeah, but were, was the majority of the audience share in the left wingers or were the majority of accounts? Because it's question. different, right? They I don't know. Because they could have they could have five hundred you know like yeah. two audience two audience per left wing account, but that doesn't mean anything. Yeah, I I don't know to tell you the truth, but 
anyway, um, so that has, uh, you know, everybody a little bit, um, you know, unnerved on the online sphere. But going back to what you're saying about um, Republican enthusiasm, what did you make of the whole Kanye West thing? Because to tell you the truth, I thought it was just bizarre. But, you know, Elvis and Nixon shared a handshake. So who knows? Anything's possible. Well, so my take on this is fairly positive. I, in terms of, you know, Trump talking to a celebrity, it wasn't just Kanye that was there. I believe also Kid Rock was present. I think the Beach Boys, or at least a member of them was there and a number of other uh, celebrities. And I think maybe some sports stars were there. I forget what the hell they were talking about in general, but they were there. Uh, you know, this, it, even if you take it as the banality of what it is, it's fine. I don't care one way. What's interesting about it, naturally, uh, is an indication to me that it must mean something pretty important, is the degree to which, once again, left-wing media felt the need to really attack Kanye for this. Not just saying, how dare he be there, he's just a, a proxy for white nationalism, he's an Uncle Tom, but also he's, they play again, he's, crazy. <laughs> he's mentally unhinged. he's crazy, and the worst part yet is, is, oh, his mother must be rolling in her grave. Keep in mind, his mother died when he and she was very young. She was, you know, the, you know, Kanye's from the south side of Chicago. He went to the school district that I went to. Ultimately, uh, this is, you know, this is not a kid who's just an average kind of run of the mill guy in the, you know, in the bad part of town. He actually went to a better, got a better education than most would have. And they're trying to make this game that, like, not only is he unhinged, but his his mother is now a card to use against him. It was kind of ugly. Mm. It was exactly what I had said before a few podcasts ago. And, you know, forgive the language here, but I'm going to use it. They, you know, as far as the left concern, you know, the black man could do no wrong until he starts siding with the Republican side. Then he's just another nigger. Mm. That's their attitude on this. And they treated him like one. And his fellow black Americans did, too. They really took umbrage to this. And here's why I think that's important. And this is electoral math, because I think our uh, ethno-nationalist friends kind of are freaking out about this, but I would tell, say it this way. Trump isn't trying to get 90% or 80% or even a majority of the black vote. He doesn't need that. The Democrats need 90% plus turnout of the black vote to Democrats, and they need to turn out a lot in order to win. Yeah. If Trump cuts away at that enthusiasm, or even if he boosts his share to like 15% Democrats are fucked in some sense because they need all of those votes. It's how the math works. It's just how it is. It's much easier for him to fuck with that a little bit. He doesn't need to win the majority. People are misunderstanding what's going on here. And every time Kanye, who, you know, I, he's not my particularly favorite performer, but I know that he has talent and I know people like him. The more and more you keep pushing this guy around, even if, you still get 90% of the black vote share going to the Democrats. If their enthusiasm is lower because of this, you're fucked. Yeah. It's that simple. Yeah. I mean, you, you, people forget that it was the black vote, energized black vote, that got um, Obama to beat Hillary in uh, 2008. Yeah, it's just how this math works. You remember, you're not always thinking about your core voters. This is basic electoral politics 101 your core voters are those who are always going to vote for you no matter what even if you kind of even if you're you know, an idiot a little way you know they're if they're going to vote they're going to vote for you you're always fighting on the margins here and all i think you're seeing whether it's trump strategy or not it, it's i think happening that you are seeing uh black enthusiasm for the democrats going down a bit Yep. Now, there have been polls like Rasmussen put out a poll that had like 30 plus percent of black Americans are kind of approving of the president. And people are turning around saying, oh, that is so outlandish. There is no way real polls say, oh, it's only oh, about God. 12 or 15 percent enthusiasm for the president. And my response is, if that's the case, 12 or 15 percent and that translates to votes, you're still fucked. Mm-hmm. You know, that, mm-hmm. that's that's the point. I, what they're trying to minimize and it shows me how fearful they are hence the response to kanye west is the degree to which this is a reality of their voting strategy they need that high enthusiasm and they need it at 90 percent plus mm, exactly they cannot allow any defections because they've already the, Hispa- the democrats and hispanics have, too yeah way. yeah because the, the the democrats have sort of like given up the ghost on asians because south asians 
ha- vote Republican. Uh, East Asians, once they start accumulating some wealth, they start voting Republican. And so they're holding on to the Latino vote and the black vote. The black vote especially. The black vote is always like a bedrock, you know, numbers that they can count on. 90% vote, but you're right. If, they, if it goes down to 80%, they're fucked. They're fucked big time. And the funny thing is that we're starting to see that in some of the, some of the races, the Senate races that were sort of marginal, like the um, Beto O'Rourke, um, Ted Cruz fight. You know, Cruz. Yeah, they is, were banking on they were banking on Hispanic enthusiasm. Yeah, taking you know, O'Rourke over the top, and it's not happening. And Cruz is care, what, running away now. They're trying to celebrate the fact that they've had like they've raised nearly forty million dollars. Who cares? Beat O'Rourke. Who care? If he loses, it doesn't mean anything. It's yeah. just you piss that money away. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, and and better O'Rourke, he looks like Bobby Kennedy. But he's no Bobby Kennedy. You know, I knew Bobby Kennedy, and you are not Bobby Kennedy, sir. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, no, I mean, like, he, he's, um, I think that actually the, the thing that turns off people is that the more they get to know the guy and that um, drunk driving thing, that drunk driving thing, it, it's. See, he's like a Kennedy after all. Yeah, he is. <laughs> All he had to do was drive it into a fucking ravine with a young girl in the back, and it's all hunky dory. No, yeah. yeah, let her drown, and he would be fine today. Yeah, and so so better O'Rourke. Yeah, and the thing is also that that it's becoming increasingly clear. The Kavanaugh confirmation ended, and what what's happened to uh, Blasey Ford? Nobody even knows about her. She's just memory hold, right? That's the thing, and people. Well, she she announced. I saw this like this news. I forgot who reported it. I think it was ABC uh, that. She decided not to pursue any of her allegations against Brett Kavanaugh. Of course, of course, of not. course she wouldn't. Yeah, she. Well, she did. Re- remember, there was that GoFundMe campaign that I think raised north of seven hundred grand. I'm yeah. sorry. Not, yeah, at least seven hundred grand, maybe more. Yeah, I. I, I the last number. And I, her I, lawyers. I, yeah. Her lawyers were working pro bono, so this frankly seems to be all going to her. Yeah. Hey, seven hundred grand payday, not too shabby. Not too shabby for some crocodile tears, you know? Yeah. And the thing is, see, I'm wondering if they're going to pursue something against her and the other, um, you know, the, the other bimbo eruptions. I mean, l- look, the, the Swetnik one, for instance, I mean, that, that seems defamatory. Because, you know, sex parties when they were teenagers and shit like that, and come on, man. Well, this reminds me, did you hear any, well, before I go there, I'll say the Republicans don't have a backbone to, to do something daring like that. Mm. But what I will say is, did you have, or I ask you, did you hear about the conspiracy theory thinking on some circles of the left thinking that is M- Michael Abernathy controlled up or uh, not Abernathy, Michael, Avenatti. Uh, Avenatti controlled opposition for the Republicans? Because if you really think about it, as soon as he brought in his extreme claims, that's when people started just collectively coming to the conclusion, these accusations suck. Yeah, and regardless of the quote unquote credibility mm. of Ford, which I actually don't think it was there, but you know, yeah, people were convinced that, that aside, it was there. Yeah. So I'll accept that. Let's just accept that it is true. The fact that she's living, she's existing in this uh, cornucopia of bullshit yeah. doesn't do her too well. Yeah. Right. Uh, so there is that kind of conspiratorial thinking going around. I don't think Avenatti is that clever. No to do it no um but it's certainly an interesting thought and it does speak to the reality of the situation was our strategy on the right should be find as much of these loonies as possible and let them talk yeah let them do <laughs> yeah. Thing. Let them, yeah don't don't hide them just like put them at the forefront you know actually do the hillary strategy with trump because that was her her, her thinking though so so we have to be a little careful here uh, see, because it's all good and fine to push the loony, you know, the the Pied Piper strategy. But you got to be careful because what happens if they start really believing in the Pied Piper? Okay, the Avenatti guy. The Avenatti is like um, living in LA and working in LA a, a bit. I can tell you, he is a classic LA attorney. You know, super slick, super you know, bronzed and lean, and the guy probably works out like ninety minutes every morning. You know, you know, it's like weights and cardio and Pilates and God knows what, right? And, uh, you know, he's got all kinds of like uh, grooming things that you couldn't even imagine. And they all cost a fortune, you know, like eyebrow removal for $500 and shit like that, right? Um, to, to look incredibly slick. I mean, forget about the expense on his clothes, right? The guy, he's like a total package, right? 
I've seen those kinds of lawyers, those kinds of people are a dime a dozen. Lawyers, managers, what have you, uh, agents. They're all over LA. They, they grow like weeds out there, right? And these guys are masters of bullshit. And the thing is, see, when you are in their presence, they radiate that uh, uh, reality distortion field. You, you will believe any insane story that they spin, okay? And, and this, is, this is what's interesting is that, see, as you step further and further away from them, you realize that their story is bullshit. But the closer you are to them, i.e., if you're a reporter interviewing the guy and he says, spin some crazy-ass yarn, you'll believe it and you'll report it as, as truth. And so it's not really surprising that the idiotic claims that Avenatti was peddling uh, were taken seriously uh, by the press because he's an incredibly seductive figure. He, he, that's his job. His job is to seduce people into giving him what he wants in order to make a lot of money, okay? That's his purpose. He, he is basically, uh, um, it would be more understandable if she, if she were like a high-priced uh, high high hooker. You know, all spritzed up and dressed up and with hair and perfectly in place and all the rest of it. Then you'd understand the situation going on. The closer you are to a figure like him, the more convincing he is, no matter how insane what he says. And as you step away, you start to realize this guy is just spouting so much bullshit. And um, so, yeah, it, it blew up in, in the Democrats' face. And, yeah, I think that Kavanaugh and Trump and everybody... Uh, on the Republicans on our side of the fence should thank their lucky stars for Avenatti because the the, the Blasi Ford was serious and it could have torpedoed him all on its own. Then the second one, that was sort of like, oh, you know, maybe there's something there, but the third one was too insane. It, it, it really just, it, it just, it, it was Peter crying wolf too many times. Yeah. Well, it, it it allowed the Republicans to make the argument I've been trying to get them to make for a long time, which is this. You know, you the the left has accepted in the era of me too to you know, create kangaroo court situations where not just guilt until proven innocent, but that the mere accusation is sufficient evidence. Yeah. It's sufficient proof. That is enough to bring you down and to hear Republicans like um what's oh what's this uh one senator uh uh his name escapes me but uh yeah bill cassidy i forget which mm -hmm. state he's from uh, but on several instances he was people were heckling him in the halls mm -hmm. of you know whatever where, you know the congress building and he would push back and say no you know you you know you, what you're saying is effectively that evidence doesn't matter and then you're more than happy to have accusations what if Someone went up and said shit about your husband or your child without any evidence. Is that sufficient grounds? And they, you know, they really don't have a response to it other than to, you know, to say, oh, but, but this investigation, this, that, and that, and process is like, you know, spare it from me. Yeah. And there was like this just the other day, you know, there's video online if you see it. The protester basically accosts Senator Cassidy in the hallway again. And she demands, because she has her little kids in strollers, she says, <laughs> apologize to my children for ruining their futures. And without, without losing a beat, he turns to the kids and says, guess what? Your parents are using you as tools. In the future, if somebody makes an allegation against you and there's no proof for it, you'll be okay. <laughs> oh, and he goes away. owned, owned. Yeah, I mean, there's that great picture of Lindsey Graham walking away from some insane protester. As he fixes his Straightening tie. Straightening his tie. <laughs> yeah, he's yeah. fixing his tie. And he's got this big old smile on his face. That was that was priceless. I memed it out. I, I, I put a caption, you know, uh, uh, proud member of the patriarchy. It was goddamn funny. It was a funny, funny shot. It, it was a still from a video, but still, it, it just worked beautifully. The, the yeah, somebody had like footage of that event and they kind of synced it up to staying alive by the Bee Gees. And it was just a you know, smooth criminal kind of. Uh, <laughs> I, I haven't seen that meme. I'll, I'll look for it. Oh, damn, it was funny. But like, yeah, I mean, like everything seems to be coming up roses for the Republicans, but they do have this nasty habit of fucking it up at the 11th hour. And, uh, and by the way, you know, the, the, the whole, the Fed raising rates at this time, what the fuck is that all about? Do you think that it's, that it's basically... Uh, uh, the deep state trying to shellac the economy in order to get the Democrats, give the Democrats a boost in the final, in the final inning. 
I think we live in a world where these are easy conclusions to come to. I, I hesitate to do it in part because I know the Fed has throughout these past few years have been trying to raise rates for a while yeah. now. And I think you, we have to keep in mind the timing of the market. We're now 10 years past the recession or the start of the last recession. And you still have people in the market ready to kind of take their profits in a bear market. And I think you have forces who just want to see this kind of happen and go for it. They don't really give a shit who the president is. Yeah. So I can't claim ultimately to know one way or the other, but I do know or I do suspect there are just uh, multiple forces potentially driving this risk situation here. Yeah. I, I think people would, should be leery of wanting to see that happen, even if it's for what they think are short-term political gains, because it's stupid to want to have to reintroduce a recession into the fucking world. N nobody wants that. It could be inevitable. It probably is eventually. All merry-go-round stop. But why would you want to encourage it? Unless you, you're just a, sh a guy who's looking to make some short short money and you are just a sicko. Mm. That's the attitude I have to take. Well, there is something to be said about the current Fed chairman, Jerome Powell. Uh, unlike Janet Yellen, who, I don't know, she was just a fucking placeholder. She was a fucking idiot. Uh, Jerome Powell, at least, is making an aft active and concerted effort to unwind QE. Okay, um, I personally ha have always been of the opinion of a drastic solution to the QE situation. Simply uh, take the, the the federal the treasury bonds and and declare them you know burnt, and just burn them, and and just you know just throw them up. In, I mean just shred them and and just uh, you know uh, 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 shrink your balance sheet by by way of fire. Have a big old bonfire behind the Eccles building, you know, and just um, you know bring out a few gallons of gasoline and just set them all on fire, and and call it a day. Uh, because I think that those treasury bonds sloshing around uh, do no service to the economy in general. Um, I mean, because basically what QE was, was the monetization of federal government debt. And it was successful, <laughs> despite everything. I mean, I, I, honest to God, still cannot believe it that, you know, the, the various iterations of quantitative easing uh, whereby the, for those of you who don't know, the Federal Reserve basically between the periods of uh, 2008 and approximately 2012, 2013, I believe, uh, they uh, basically printed money out of thin air and used this money to purchase uh, U.S. Treasury bonds and thereby finance the government, uh, maintain low interest rates, and uh, prevented what was going to be a... a a, a collapse of the economy. I mean, you you do have to give the devil his due. I, at the time, especially you know in two thousand eight, two thousand nine, there was a real sense that the whole ship could go up in flames, and so that that they did the policy. I I, I think it was just. I I, th I thought at the time that this is crazy. This is going to lead to hyperinflation. It has happened historically every other time in history. And yet this time they were able to get away with it, probably because of other extraneous factors that are not important for this conversation. But Jerome Powell is of the opinion that he has to unwind this position. That means that he has to take all these federal um, treasury bonds that he has in the, uh, on his balance sheet and start selling them back into the market and soaking up that cash. And he's been doing this, you know, a little by little. But at the same time, you know, raising rates... I don't know. I mean, he's basically saying, trying to, you know, get some dry powder for the next crisis, which is something that Janet Yellen should have done back when she started in her in her chairmanship, but she failed to do. So I sort of like approve of what Jerome Powell is doing um, within the framework of, of Fed policy, even as I think that the Federal Reserve shouldn't exist and we should just allow interest rates to be set by banks, because after all, interest rates are the price of money, and the price of anything should be set by supply and demand, not by a, a, a quasi-government or, uh, organization that is really not beholden to anybody, that, that is really just, you know, I, I, I mean, I, I've, I've always had, had a, a deep ambivalence about the uh, Federal Reserve. And well, the Fed is partially beholden to the banks because they know as members of the reserve, they're not going to make a huge amount of money, but they know that if they work their way back into the private uh, sphere after doing nice by the banks, they can get a much better position. Yeah. Yeah. So they sort of are, especially the New York Fed. Yeah. 
And so, so, so you see, you see that. I mean, I have a whole, I have a whole bunch of things about the Fed, but I mean, I do believe that the best solution, long term, I mean, the way to go would be to, you know, deregulate the price of money, not allow it to be controlled by a central bank, because I think that that is pernicious, because it leads to. Um, it leads to market distortions, which is what we saw. We, we saw during the Greenspan period, where all of these loans were taken out, uh, housing loans and what have you. The, the Greenspan period of easy money, you know, uh, the, the quote-unquote great moderation, which retrospectively is just the, the great appeasement, you know, uh, it, it was disastrous. If we had had a free market economy insofar as, uh, a free market uh, rather insofar as interest rates, we wouldn't have had the distortions that happened during Greenspan and that eventually blew up in poor Ben Bernanke's face. I mean, does this seem reasonable to you? I mean, probably it does. I mean, I I don't think I can say anything more about the Fed than has been said by others, mm-hmm. right? Uh, you know, yes, it's certainly in, you're giving power to folks to just do as they kind of politically will on a number of fronts uh, to the degree to which you can control them. Good luck. Uh, they tend to control the situation. I just remind everybody of you know 2008 again, where people just assumed that more or less the Fed and Treasury assumed near dictatorial power over these matters. So there you go. Mm. My thinking is that in 2008, we should have al- allowed all the banks to go under. Just like a clean sweep, you know, uh, because the problems were never really solved. And we still have the same problem and the, the debt overhang. It's not gone anywhere. And I, I'm, I'm a f- big believer that big financial crises, yeah, of course, they're destructive. But this is the creative destruction of capitalism on the one hand. And on the other, having a, a clean sweep, having the whole thing just fall apart and you just show up with <laughs> you know, a shovel and a broom and a, and, a, and a dustpan and just start cleaning it all up. In the end, it's healthier for the system. That's my thinking. And the fact that the, um, the zombies, many of the banks who, that should have been allowed to go under were propped up. I'm thinking specifically of Citibank. Citibank. Well, we, sh- we shouldn't have subsidized those bank level losses. I think if we were going to subsidize anything, it was to re- make sure that the, um, uh, the FDIC was fully prepared to handle any kind of bank runs. Yeah. Basically. Yeah. That's all you needed. Yeah. That's all you needed. Right. I mean, look, and ensuring that the federal government I, I bet it must have cost a lot less than 700 billion to backstop uh, everybody's deposits okay so the federal government on its own could have done that I think that uh, bailing out the banks was catastrophic and and just yeah I mean I personally made a shit ton of money because I bet that the US government would never let Citibank go under and lo and behold they didn't and I I made out like a bandit you know good on me but I think that you know, one thing is personal profit, but the other thing is is the issue of the principle of the thing. And the principle of the thing is that it was a disaster. It was a disaster to have saved City and all the other banks. It was a disaster to, to have done everything that was basically sort of like turned into some heroic story in that godforsaken book by Aaron Sorkin, the, you know, Too Big to Fail. Yeah, that, that was the problem. Too Big to Fail means that they were too big to exist, so they should have been allowed to go extinct. You know? I still maintain that if you are going to employ a concept of too big to fail, I want you to be very specific on what that threshold is, size of assets under management. I don't care what. Once you define it, I will then use that standard to look at every single bank. And if a bank exceeds that mark, I will split it and yeah. break it up until it's below that mark. Exactly. If you want to play that game, that's how we're going to play it. Yeah, exactly. Exactly right. Exactly right. Uh, um. Uh, you couldn't. I could not have uh, said it any better. That if you have that standard, then yeah, everybody's got to be broken down to that standard or smaller. Yeah, because you know, too big to fail means uh, too big to exist. But well, so anyway, um, th- there is a sense that the Democrats are so desperate that they might resort to some sort of like, you know, uh, um, controlled destruction of the economy, quote unquote. In order to win the um, win at the ballot box, which is it's, somebody was suggesting this. Who was it? Somebody was saying, you know, somebody like I, uh, I don't know if it was Cenk Uger or or somebody like that was saying that what we need is um is a recession or something. 
or Bill it Maher. Was Bill, I think it was probably Bill Maher. Bill Maher was looking forward to the next recession because it would mean that it'd be a political tool he could use against Trump. Uh, Bill Maher is, continues to prove himself to be a waste of space. <laughs> he was always annoying uh, from the get-go. I used to enjoy him at his more cynical, more friendly to the libertarian perspective of things attitude. But eventually he made plenty of money and started becoming a major Democratic Party donor. And now, lo and behold, he has no thoughts to his own. Uh, that does remind me, though, um, especially in the aftermath, because he had Steve Bannon come on mm -hmm. uh, his show. And Bannon held his own, as I expected, against Bill Maher's stupid shit. Uh, but what re reminded me of, because I always make fun of Bill Maher's walrus audience, that every time he says a uh, left-wing talking point, they go, ooh, ooh, this is funny. <laughs> uh, the NPC meme is another one that I think is really working well, um, because it, it reduces the, the left-wing to what we perceive of as its reality, which is when it comes to actual thinking, they act like a, an NPC, basically a non-playable character, you know, <laughs> no human emotion or, in, or intellect behind it. They're just responding as if written. Uh, I know people are very annoyed with that. They're like you're dehumanizing us. I'm like, no, you're dehumanizing yourself. I'm just <laughs> noticing. it. Uh, I, so I was happy to kind of see that become a bigger part of the limelight. Oh, and I don't know if you've noticed it. Yeah. I, I, I was pivoting a li little bit more into the entertainment business. Uh, Zero Hedge is reporting uh, that ABC regrets firing Roseanne. Quote, we didn't think it through properly. <laughs> you think? Oh, man. Because apparently the, the, the spinoff show that, where they killed off Roseanne's character, who was the main character and the anchor of the whole damn show. I mean, she was the, the star of the show. They killed her off and they did the show, the spinoff show called The Connors with all the other actors. And uh, that show is debuting this coming Tuesday, uh, October what? October 16th, I believe. And see. The, yeah, and they're preparing it for it to be a disaster. Yeah. It's going to be like, probably what's going to happen is that the first show, everybody's going to watch it, you know, because they want to see what, what, what are they going to do with the show without Roseanne? You know, how's it going to be? And it's probably not going to play very well because I personally never liked Roseanne, but I could understand her appeal and, and the, the, the certain trashy charisma that she projects. I, I, like I said, I don't, I don't, how can I put this? I don't like her character and yet I find her personally oddly compelling. But I, I, I would sure love to be in a dinner party with her. She must be really interesting. But like more contact than that? You, I can, no. <laughs> yeah. What? I can tell you with I can tell you with near perfect certainty that most working class Americans, Midwestern Americans, really like her. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, just the fact of the matter. Yeah. I also respect in the aftermath of this how she she was on Joe Rogan's podcast. I didn't see the whole interview. I saw kind of summaries of it. Mm -hmm. And I give her a lot of credit for this. She says, look, obviously she didn't want to leave the show, but she says, look, I've been very conscientious of people trying to make a living. And she went along with it because she didn't want her pride to interfere with people still having work to do. Right. You know, she wasn't about to break it yeah. on account of her own account. So I give her a lot of credit for that because she could have easily said, this is bullshit. We're not playing that game. Yeah. Which you know, I still think it doesn't. It, it's probably not going to work because it's it's the Roseanne show. It's not these folks around me, yeah. per se. Uh, but I give her credit for you know sticking up for the people who work for her. I think that will reflect much better on her than people give her credit for. For all we know, I mean, you know, ABC is going to realize, oh, maybe quickly shooting ourselves in the head and killing our top rated show. Well, that's probably such a good was idea. a mistake. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a, by the third show, uh, the third iteration of the Connors. You know, in two, three weeks' time, third, fourth episode. Then we'll see how it really went, and probably it's not going to do very well because, like the first one, the first two shows, everybody's going to watch it. Everybody's going to want to see. You know, probably more people are going to watch it um, just to see how they muddle through without Roseanne. Um, I wonder if they killed her off. I assume they just killed her off, right? You know what I'm waiting for? I I'm waiting for, you know, they're going to do the two or three episodes with her dad and they're going to realize, oh shit, the audience doesn't like this. I'm really waiting for them to pull the surprise of, you know, they'll go to episode four, Roseanne wakes up and says, oh, I had this horrible dream. A la like the new heart show. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, for those of you who don't know, um, there, you know, Bob Newhart, the comedian had two shows. One was called the Bob Newhart show where he's a psychiatrist in Chicago. Then he had a second show called Newhart. Uh, which was about a kind of like a New Yorkish 
character retiring and opening a B&B in Vermont. And at the end of the seven years of the second show, the last episode has him waking up in his first show with his old wife and saying, oh, my God, you wouldn't believe the dream I just had. <laughs> <laughs> All of the second show was just bullshit for you know, a uh, dream from the first show. That's what I'm kind of waiting for, for them to see how desperate they get. It's like, oh, Rose, we got to get her fucking back in there. We made a mistake. You think that they'll uh, bring her back? Who knows? If they're desperate enough and if the executives are making noise, I think they're trying to test the waters of that kind of situation. Because I think what, you know, look at in, you know, in retrospect, what's happened since. Yes, other folks have gotten fired, uh, you know, uh, James Gunn. But look, they other people haven't like uh, what's her face, Sarah Jung from the New York Times, Don Lemon for yeah. basically calling, you know, <laughs> Kanye West a minstrel, <laughs> yeah. uh, which is as <laughs> fucking disgusting as you can get. Yeah. Um, yeah, he's he's not going anywhere anytime soon. And by the way, uh, James Gunn got hired by DC to fix uh, Suicide Squad, I think. So, you know, the, the, all these games keep going. They keep playing. So ABC may turn around and say, OK, she did her penance. <laughs> and uh, money's money yeah. and we got to get we got to get cracking here so I, I would love that i would love them to kind of come back to to her cap in hand saying please come back please we need money <laughs> kind of attitude yeah because th this kind of like uh you know uh ouroboros kind of society where where anybody who says anything even slightly out of line is just absurd there was a really interesting study um done shoot where'd it go uh, uh i lost it it appeared in the atlantic or, or there was a discussion of it in the atlantic uh basically it, it oh man i just had it right here just a second ago yeah it was i i it's a, it was the report that said hey look the vast majority of the country is uncomfortable with pc culture ironically enough the groups right. Right. most opposed to it are minorities like black yeah i'm oh, yeah. sorry black, excuse me Asians and Hispanics yeah. hate it more than whites. Yeah. I think the people who hate it the least, even though it's still 75% of them hate it, are black people. Yeah. Uh, but basically what that's telling you is that it's a, uh, basically it's an upper, highly educated, middle-class white and blacks who are playing this game yeah. and the rest of the country doesn't want to play. Yeah, it's called, the study is called Hidden Tribes, a study of America's polarized landscape. And um, th these people seem to have done a very serious study. This is about 160 pages. I'm looking at it now. I'll leave a link in the description. Uh, but th the study basically says that people are, are very afraid of uh, political correctness. And as one, uh, th this white 50-some-odd, 50 57-year-old man said, he said, you know, uh, I'm paraphrasing, of course. He said, if I say the wrong thing out of just not knowing what the right thing is, I can l lose my job. And, you know, this is kind of crazy, which is absolutely true. You know, if you don't know the right, the woke terminology, what, uh, quote unquote, then you can become ostracized nearly instantly and it can have profound damaging effects on your lives. And, and so people are re reacting against this, justifiably so. And the Atlantic ran the thing, it's sort of like trying to poo-poo it. But I think that this, this study is actually a lot more important than, than the Atlantic or other mainstream media is giving it uh, credit for. The only one on our neck of the woods who paid attention to it was Tim Poole. Um, I, I happened to have heard about this study, and then I happened to stumble upon Tim Poole's uh, post, and I watched it. It was great. Uh, and I thought that more people would be talking about it. But I looked around, it's sort of like, uh, you know, people aren't, the mainstream media, rather, is not paying much attention to it. Or sort of like pretending it's not there. And like I said, the, the Atlantic article sort of like poo-pooed it. But the, the, what it's basically saying is that the crazies, the, the, the insane people, the politically correct people, are a very small ma minority. And the vast majority of people are against this nonsense. And, and yeah. Yeah, so here's, these are the two choice paragraphs that you should take away from the Atlantic article. I'll read them. They're very quick. Uh, so the point was saying like, well, you know, most of the, you know, the, most people seem to be annoyed with this. So where does the support come from? While 83% of respondents who make less than $50,000 a year dislike political correctness, just 70% of those who make more than $100,000 a year are skeptical about it. Just 70%. Just, just 70. And while 87% who have never attended college think that political correctness has grown to be a problem, only 66% of those with postgraduate degree share the sentiment. Again, it's ideologically created. Political tribe, as defined by the authors, is an even better predictor of views on political correctness. 
Among devoted conservatives, 97% believe that political correctness is a problem. <laughs> Among traditional liberals, 61% do. Progressive activists are the only group that strongly backs political correctness. Only 30% see it as a problem. Only now, if 30%, if 30 <laughs> of the people on the who are fucking on the, on the fucking vanguard of the situation think it's a problem, what does that tell you? Yeah. Exactly. Even your devotees have a, you know, because remember, all it takes is about 30 to 33 percent of a population to start, you know, fucking with, yeah. uh, you know, the system. Yeah, right? exactly. And if your vanguard, if that part of your vanguard is concerned about it, you'd be I'd be, you know, leery. But, you know, conversely, you then have to say, well, clearly it's a clear minority of the country who are dictating this. And I think the Taleb Caleb talks about this, I think, in his one of his books, probably the most recent one. Where he says, hey, look, there's a situation in which a minority invariably is going to have a lot of dictatorial control in some situations because they're, the effort it takes to that you need to make sure that they don't freak out is more palatable to the majority than trying to kind of curtail the minority. For example, if you guys will probably know this. You have ever sh uh, <laughs> trying to organize lunch for a large group of people. If you got one vegan in the crowd, <laughs> the vegan has a lot of sway yeah. over what you're going to eat because you have to appeal to them. And, you know, well, we'll figure out some more vegetarian friendly you dishes. Appease them. You have to appease them, not appeal uh, yeah, yeah. to them. Appease, appease them. them. And, everybody, and, you know, the, the meat eaters tend to be more flexible and saying, well, it's probably easier for us to get something that's vegetarian friendly as opposed to you know fuck it you know kick her out of the organization we're all just going to have a slab of meat and enjoy ourselves kind of here the other you know you have to kind of appease a minority in that situation yeah, the tyranny and of the minority talks about the tyranny of the minority talks about like kosher laws or halal shit typically being examples of this i think this is a similar situation yeah i i i completely agree there's the other thing too is that a lot of people were um uh, what you call it, poo-pooing the whole notion of political correctness by saying, well, yeah, political correctness is bad, but hate speech is much worse. To tell the truth, I mean, no fucking around. I have never heard anybody use uh, um, a, a racial epithet uh, in, a, in a meaningful way. I'm 50 years old, okay? And I have never heard, oh, no, no, that's not true. Like uh, a couple of times when I was very young, I heard one individual, a very distasteful individual, uh, used a racial epithet. Uh, he called a Jewish person a racial epithet. And, and I saw it, you know, personally. And that happened in, I don't know, 81, 82. And I remember it, of course, because it was shocking, right? Uh, since then, I have honestly never heard any kind of person address any other by some racial epithet. I've I've seen white people call black people asshole or vice versa, but it was not based on race. It was based on the guy just being unpleasant or being perceived as unpleasant or or unhelpful or what have you. But I have never seen that, and I've I've had enough experience with people and enough interactions with people. I mean, I'm not living in a locked room for crying out loud. Okay, so th this hate speech stuff. What the hell are we talking about? Because hate speech, as I define it, is bigoted speech. But if you start saying that hate speech is basically speech that I hate, speech that I don't like, well, then the, you know, the sky's the limit on that one, you know? But, you know? Well, it's intentionally left to be vague. ambiguous yeah. because vague, because that gives the power to the accuser. Yeah. And you have a lot more ability to accuse people when you can, anything can be hate speech. So that's naturally going to continue to be the case. My favorite defense of political correctness is from. Idiots like, and I know the two people who have made this argument are guys like Neil Gaiman and Josh Whedon. In other words, these cucked beta male yeah. science fiction writers who no, gave no, up no. their talent. No, no, I, I, I disagree. Bitches. I think that. Uh, the, no, no. Well, let me yeah, let me yeah. finish the Go thought ahead. first. Sorry. Um, uh, their attitude is always on political correctness. It's not political correctness. It's just being polite. They should just <laughs> change it every instance. I'm like you're a fucking idiot. Yeah. You know. But that's the general attitude they have. It's like, oh, it's not what you think it is. Yeah. But even though. <laughs> Political correctness is itself, you could tell it in the voice of the people who profligate it. They are fully motivated by hate. Yeah. It's their language. Yeah. 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 And, and what's interesting to me is that a lot of those guys, you were mentioning Neil Gaiman, Neil Gaiman especially. He's like a, a future, you know, uh, male feminist ally who turned to be turned out to be groping or raping women or some shit like that. And Joss Whedon, kind of like the same. Well, well, uh, his wife said that he, wa he wasn't exactly uh, uh, his ex-wife. 
granted, you know, ex-wives are ne- rarely complimentary about a guy. But um, yeah, you know, the, the guys, the, there's stuff there. You always know, when, whenever you have these male feminists, there's, it turns out either they're gay, I mean, seriously gay, and they've been closeted, right? Or they're assholes. They're assholes who do nasty shit, you know, uh, and it, it eventually comes out. Um, well, I've certainly heard that in the case of Josh Whedon. I don't know what the story is for Neil Gaiman. I know he was actually very talented, created very good material before he started fucking and, and he married Amanda Palmer, the creepy performance artist uh, who is basically very motivated by feminism and social justice bullshit. I've never and just gotten into Neil Gaiman, to tell you the truth. Uh, he, 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 if you're trying to get into what he's done now, it, you're best not to. His main work of interest to me was his comic series on Sandman, which is a very interesting kind of surrealist comic piece. Uh, And it's very long. But, you know, he really kind of went off the deep end after he married her, as per typical, when guys get involved with thoughts, because she is. And what's interesting, whenever I hear him speak, because I don't encounter him usually through his own work, I encounter him through documentaries I like to see on some older artists who he's nominally a fan of. And there were two documentaries in particular that really annoyed me. Uh, and it, it, I'm going to get to the point of why I think these guys are motivated by hate. Uh, nominally, he's supposed to be a fan of HP Lovecraft and Steve Ditko, HP Lovecraft. We all know who he is. Steve Ditko is the comic artist who created Spider-Man with Stan Lee, mm-hmm. arguably the more creative element of it. But Steve Ditko was very famous for being a conservative, hard right wing guy and an Ayn Randian objectivist during part of his life. Mm -hmm. So whenever they would bring Neil Gaiman on to talk about these guys, he was fundamentally just very dismissive of them. And he's supposed to be a fan, but he spent most of his time saying, oh, H.P. Lovecraft was, you know, had this horrid style and he was a racist and all these things. Or, oh, Steve Ditko, you know, he was just a fucking lunatic when it came to politics. And I think of it more as outsider art than legitimate art. In other words, he's just a crazy guy who does crazy things. And isn't it nice to ironically enjoy his crazy things? This is, a you know, the rantings of a man who's fundamentally motivated by hate, not by much else. And if this is really what's motivating, it guarantee I guarantee you that's why his work is not worth consuming in these times maybe back when he was just really legitimately interested in his own art but clearly now you know he, he's he doesn't have a pot to piss in or, or a position to uh, artistic, really you mean you know artistic a yeah, real artistic position to articulate and i i think he's just a son of a bitch now well the thing that can happen and we've seen it countless times is that an artist can become uh successful in his art and this translates into into mainstream fame and that mainstream fame leads the artist to sort of like lose direction. Uh, the, the example I always think of is U2. U2 was always preachy. Uh, you know, back when they were starting out in the early 80s, they were like re- really preachy and, and all this shit, right? And then they did uh, Unforgettable Fire, which was, uh, you know, it was about uh, uh, Martin Luther King and civil rights and all that crap. I mean, that was the whole point of the album. And then he, they did um, Joshua Tree, which is, you know, an artistic breakthrough. Uh, it was it, it sort of like really brought together Brian Eno's vision and their own musicianship and really coalesced into something quite magnificent. I mean, Joshua Tree really is a great album. And, and then they, they sort of like did a, a, an album of Leftovers, which was uh, Rattle and Hum. And, and they sort of like went a little nuts because they started, because after Joshua Tree, they were on the cover of Time magazine. Very famously so. And uh, this was in 87. And 88, 89, they sort of like went crazy. They did a movie, like a tour movie, and and they just got high on their own farts, right? And luckily, somebody was Mm -hmm. able to ground them down. And so they went off to Morocco and they recorded um, uh, this, uh, the album Octum Baby, which really is one of the great albums ever made. I mean retrospectively, track after track after track. It's just, all of them are classics. It's a great album. It's, it's one of the great rock albums. It, it's not particularly groundbreaking. Um, and I don't think that one is, is the greatest song ever because a lot of idiot uh, reviewers, music critics, think that one, think truly, truly think that one is the greatest song ever made. But it's one of the tracks on And they album. probably think Imagine is number two, yeah, so, so fuck them. But, but anyway, uh, but... No, I mean, Give the Devil is Due, Octum Baby is a truly great album. It's the best album they ever did. 
But after that, they really started huffing, uh, uh, you know, huffing their own farts. I mean, they really went off the deep end and into the social justice warrior shit. And after 91, after Achtung Baby, it's all been downhill. It's all been downhill for U2 artistically. Every single album that they've done has been more inconsequential than the last. Uh, and they are great musicians, but they, they fell in love with their own celebrity and wanted to be you know, social movers. I mean, now you have Bono talking about the dissolution of all uh, frontiers and shit like that. I mean, crazy talk shit. And he believes it. And he's a hero to all these people. Well, remember, also, if I, if I gather this correctly, you know, he started politics. It's something that he actually knew something about, which was the, the, the troubles in yeah. Northern Ireland. Yep. And his position was this. Look, I've, I've lived through this. It's, it's just well, continual actually, you know, people killing each other to the there. point where you could say, look, I get it. You know, that kind of makes sense. But then he just kind of takes it farther from there. Because I think that Sunday Bloody Sunday is from the late 80s. Yeah, yeah. If it, memory it, no, no, it's from the early 80s, from his uh, their album Boy, I think. Um, Sunday Bloody Sunday is about the troubles. Yeah, but remember, these boys are Irish, not Northern Irish. Okay, they're good Catholic boys. Okay. So, it's still their people. Yeah, but the thing is, see, they were removed. And, and uh, geographically, it doesn't seem like much distance. I mean, shit, in the United States, it's like next door, practically. Uh, but um, in, in Ireland, I mean, Dublin is worlds away from Belfast. It really is uh, a different country, okay? And, um, and, and so their own experience with it was, uh, yeah, sure, they knew about it, about the troubles. Of course they would. But um, it, it, they weren't involved in it. They weren't there, okay? And a lot of Irishmen think that they're full of shit, okay? So I, I think it's, I, I think that, look, Whenever a politi- uh, uh, an artist talks about contingent politics, I think it's suspect. Whenever they argue for a particular pol- position, I-, I can't quite believe them because I always suspect that they're doing it for, uh, for other reasons or they're completely misinformed. Okay. Uh, well, I think that's that's my attitude toward artists and politics. It isn't necessarily that they have opinions on politics that they articulate. It's that 99% of the time, it's very uneducated, very uninteresting positions, hmm. right? So Bono's stuff, it's transient, like, oh, you know, environmentalism affects us all. It's yeah. like, well, what is your real thought on that? Have you, you know, show me your, you know, the, how you've thought through the data sets and everything, and what you think about that. Uh, or Taylor Swift, which is the other fun thing. It's the converse of Kanye West. It, you know, remember how we left them from the mid two thousands when uh, Kanye said Bush hates black people, and he takes Taylor Swift's so, you know award yeah. from her <laughs> and everything. And you clearly think you know behind the scenes they're going certain ways politically, and then come to twenty eighteen, <laughs> switched around. Well, uh, yeah, but Kanye, you, you gotta uh, ask yourself why. You know, because uh, Taylor Swift is uh, what, she's uh, going to be 29 this year or is 29? You know, she's rapidly hitting that wall, baby. You know, why do you think that her politics are changing? You know, she, well, she, you she know, ain't got no baby. Not. You know, she probably has baby rabies and doesn't even realize it. And, uh, you know, she's losing her mind. Well, I remember she she made this announcement a few days before she won a number of VMA awards or videos or whatever awards mm-hmm. was given to her. I don't know. I don't keep track of them. Yeah. But, you know, so that's certainly entertaining. I, I don't, I never really was that excited by her music. And I know some girls in the office will yell at me for saying that, but I don't give a shit. Um, but, the, you know, that's the case. And, and even Kanye's political opinions aren't particularly exciting to me. I merely am fine with him I- expressing his interests. I think the one thing he said that I thought was interesting during the office visit to Trump was he said, you know, uh, look, my dad wasn't there when I was a kid and I can respect Hillary for whatever reason, but I wasn't feeling it. And I needed some sort of masculine energy that this hat, you know, metaphorically provided, he was saying like, you know, it makes me feel like Superman kind of thing. And what you were for whatever, you know, kind of energetic way he expresses himself, people say, Oh, clearly he's psychopathic. No, I just know people who have that manic energy about him. They're not necessarily crazy. Yeah, uh, but this was his way of kind of articulating that, and I thought that was particularly interesting. Not because it's super politically insightful, but it's a manifestation of what you and I are, tend to talk about, which was in a lot of families when you lack that masculine presence, you let you yearn for it, mm. and he certainly felt that. And I think Trump, for whatever reason, 
uh, and it's and for many years ago, this was the case for a lot more people. They don't admit it now. He was a figure to look up to, a masculine, somewhat perhaps fatherly figure. Maybe that's going a little too far, but certainly has that kind of authority to him. And that's what Kanye responded to. Yeah, I think that uh, that lack of uh, you know masculinity. Yesterday, I released a video uh, called uh, "We Live in the Matriarchy." it's sort of like I'm very uncomfortable with it because I think I sort of like devolved into a rant, which I promised to myself I'd never do, but I sort of did in that video. And I'm probably going to redo the video precisely because of that, because I, I'm like, I'm really pissed at myself. But that's for another conversation. The point is, see, we do live in this matriarchy where there is a lack of parental male uh, uh, father figures. We, we lack them and we need them. We need that, that sense to tell us what to do. Because when you're a, a young guy, you don't know what the hell you're doing, you know? And you need a guy who's been there already, who's gonna tell you, okay, do this, do that, don't do this, and do not do that. And that red button, don't press it under any circumstances. We, we need somebody to tell us, because we don't know, because we're not born with an instruction manual. And women cannot be uh, a father figure for a man, you, you know, no. It's not like a one-size-fits-all kind of thing. Uh, mothers and fathers fulfill vastly different roles. And I think that um, the sexual revolution has been catastrophic for most, uh, for most people in the Western democracies, because especially the men grew up without any kind of role model, any kind of role model to look up to and, and try to emulate and be like them. You know? Because as the, 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 the sexual revolution happened, in the media, male figures were denigrated. You got to look look around now. Which are the um, the masculine male uh, the, the masculine male role models around? Who, who's like a real man's man? To put in those blunt terms, the closest I can think of is George Clooney. I mean, can you name anybody else who's like you know ma truly a masculine figure who's not like some nebbishy schmuck or some soy boy? Well, clearly, faggot. it is the it is the president. Yeah. I mean, let's be honest. He is playing that role. Yeah. He, he's like an older guy with a hot younger wife, and he strolls around, and he, he, he did you see that that clip of him shaking hands with Macron? <laughs> he just pinwheeling him around. Macron almost fell over. He completely lost his balance by the, the, the quote-unquote alpha male handshake of Trump. It was funny as hell. Was this, a, was this before or after there were photos of Macron uh, hanging out with their oh, chested black men God. stroking him? Yeah, did you see that? What the hell was that all about, by the way? I don't know. All I could think of was uh, France. That, that was so goddamn <laughs> gay. I mean, I, I knew that the guy was gay, okay? That, that's the only explanation for the guy marrying a woman old enough to be his mother. Marrying her. Uh, I'm not saying about fucking her, you know, because he was supposedly like fucking her when he was 16 or something like that. Ah, good for him. But like, uh, you don't marry such a woman. No, 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 no. What the hell was going on? It, it just seemed crazy. You know what I mean? She fulfilled his E.T. fetish. <laughs> you see, yeah. For those who don't know, take a look at pictures of his wife head on, then take a, a look at the old E.T. puppet from the movie E.T. and you'll realize you know, what, yeah. what Macron is into. Yeah, yeah, I know. It's, it's, it's actually, you're dead on the money, yeah. But yeah, you got Trump here, who's like a man's man, but no other figure on the media landscape is like, they are all either um, soy boys, they are uh, uh, nebishy, sort of like descendants of Woody Allen, kind of, or, and George Costanza kind of figures. Or they are these really polished and plastic men. And the, uh, you see them in newscasters. You know, they're, they're like very polished and very plastic and very like. Uh, well, they, the guys I could think of are probably just getting older and are kind of fading out. Uh, I think the guy who's still kind of there is Kurt Russell. Yeah. Uh, but he's I, I still think an he older holds, gentleman. Yeah. He's, he's older guy. Uh, so even older than him would be Clint yeah. Eastwood. Yeah. And uh, to a lesser extent, because he's kind of faded out, Jack Nicholson. Yeah. Uh, I haven't really seen him in anything. Yeah, he's pretty much retired. And you know, the only folks that I could really think about are generally older. They're they're kind of pre-boomer guys. I mean, <laughs> we we just not too many months ago we lost you know uh, Burt Reynolds yeah. and a few other guys. So yeah, but Burt Reynolds was too Hollywood. You know, 
Uh, Michael Keaton, though, he's an interesting figure. Uh, uh, you know, he, he, because he hasn't done any, he hasn't had any plastic surgery. That, that's why he looks more normal. You know, if you look at uh, Robert Redford, he had that thing to his um, eyelids that make him look perpetually surprised. He looks creepy. Mm. Um, yeah, and and uh, and Tom Cruise has never been like a father figure. He's always been like the guy next door. You know. The slightly creepy. Well, he had to artificially inseminate a woman in order to become a father to begin with. <laughs> he had to what? Artificially inseminate? Oh, God knows who. I'm joking. Obviously, I yeah. can't prove that. We have but no you idea. What's her no. Face. But uh, what is true is that um, th there is no masculine figure around. Indisputably masculine figure, as you know. Back when I was growing up, you know, during the '80s, there was uh, Harrison Ford. He was like a man's man. You know, I mean, he played the president at one point, you know, in that uh, Air Force One picture. That was like a hell of a lot of fun, you know, get off my plane. <laughs> that was, mm -hmm. you know, a fun trash, you know what I mean? Uh, but he was like a man's man. There is no such figure. Uh, back in the day, also, Alec Baldwin was also just very masculine. You know, he ballooned, but that's, you know, a, another story. But he was like a guy's guy, you know, Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross. Oh, man, that was great performance. I... I can't believe that he wasn't even nominated for an Oscar for that performance because retrospectively, that is one of the great film performances. Uh, but anyway, we're, we're way off the topic. You know, what it, you know what it takes to sell real estate? It takes brass balls yeah. to sell real estate. Yeah, that was, that was a great line. You see this watch? This watch is that worth more. watch costs more than, more than your car. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that was a great, great. Scene. Well, that's a movie that is, that's a movie that's loaded with top-notch male performers, starting yeah. with, um, you know, Jack you Lemmon. have Alec Baldwin, Jack Lemmon, you have Ed Harris, you have um, <laughs> Kevin Spacey, and it of all people, uh, you also have Jonathan Price, and you have Alan Arkin, Al Pacino, heavy hitters, all of them. Al Pacino. Al Pacino. Oh, how could I even forget Al Pacino? You have heavy hitters. Most of which are masculine. Two two guys are kind of nebbishy, yeah, from the, an old, from the old tradition. But even so, Jack Lemmon is a, as masculine a nebbish guy as you can get. Yeah, he's a working stiff. Well, he's playing the yeah. role that he's supposed to play. Uh, yeah, and and the um, the Kevin Spacey role, he's the smarmy, you know, suck up kind of guy. And, and you know, he's a specific role that he's playing. Uh, uh, yeah, but the other the other one, I mean, Ed Harris, man, he was a cool motherfucker, you know. Uh, I always think of him in in the right stuff, when right. Um, when he takes the phone call and he's getting like a lot of pressure for for his wife to bring in Lyndon Johnson into her into her house, and he's like, no, if he doesn't want to stay in, that's it. You know, he's not setting foot. I back you. Yeah, 100%. he's playing John Glenn. Yeah, he's playing John Glenn. That was a great scene and a great. And he, and I did I tell you that I finally got to finish at, on your recommendation Apollo thirteen. Oh. So I did. I did see it. I did really appreciate it. I'm. I think it was silly that I didn't get around to seeing it before. I think Ed Harris gave a really great performance. I think he was nominated for that one. I don't know if he you was know, or not. Said, I would not. Be yeah, he was. I, I looked. Okay. I looked it up. He was. Yeah. And uh, you know, he had a. There was that line. You know, where they're about to come back to the Earth. Mm -hmm. And it, yeah, they're basically. You have one of the PR guys says like you know, or not the PR guy, the guy almost ultimately running the program saying. Oh, you know, this is the odds are low, and he's very, you know, depressed. And Ed Harris is like, "No, I believe this will be our finest hour, sir." You know, he just has that relentless desire to Can't make do. this mission a success. Yeah, yeah. And uh, no, it, it's uh, he's he, yeah, he's like a but okay, Ed Harris. But personally, he's his politics are a joke. I remember, uh, and you can <laughs> he was find, married you can to find... Amy Madigan. What the fuck you expect, you know? Well, I, I, this is the, the, the lowest part. Sorry, we're going into Hollywood politics, but it's important because <laughs> this, 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 this political bullshit attitude is ancient and it will never end. I remember, and you can find footage online, when uh, Elia Kazan in 1995-ish Right. Won his Lifetime Achievement Award. People in Hollywood were going to throw up fucking arms because of the, you know, him naming names to HUAC. And by the way, there were fucking communists in Hollywood, whether they whether they pretend to or not is bullshit. They were there. Mm. And I remember when they had Scorsese and De Niro flanking Kazan for protection to mm. say, no, you guys are going to fucking pay this man the respect that he deserves for all of the work he's done within the industry for his films, because that's what the award was about. 
I remember Ed Harris and a few others just sitting sternly on the ground and trying to make a political statement about, oh, this is a bad man here. I always remembered that, and I will never forget it yeah. from Mr. Harris. Yeah, uh, I agree. I, I think of uh, Nick Nolte and the chick she was banging at that time. Uh, yeah, yeah. But they were, yeah, both. You see yeah. both of them in that bullshit. Yeah. Well, the thing is, see, my um, my thinking about Ed Harris is that okay. Due respect to with all due respect to his career, he's he's a minor Hollywood actor. He was never like a the, like a big star, right? Um, so he's not really that big in, in in the world in the in the popular imagination, okay? Uh, I mean, most people, most normies, they they say, "Oh yeah, I recognize that guy," but I don't know where I saw him, you know? Because yeah, he's that kind of a guy. Everybody knows who Tom Cruise is, and, and that's the thing. See, our models for masculinity are adolescents. Like people like Tom yes. Cruise. Tom Cruise is the eternal young man, even though he's like fifty. He's pushing sixty, and he's the eternal young man, the eternal adolescent, and and that's the figure that has been made, um, that has been elevated in the popular culture. The eternal young man. Well, I think Seth 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 Rogen. Um, you know, what are those uh, brothers who are always in everything? They were. They're also with Seth Rogen in a number of those stupid comedy movies. Yeah. Uh, Chris Pratt. Um, they are all all the male figures are little boys yeah. who like to play their games, who are excited to be around a smart woman who can take charge. Uh, yeah, they may they may exhibit certain strength at some point, but they're all supposed to be cuddly and you know not not scary. But you know the truth of the matter is. A male figure is supposed to be a little bit scary. Yeah, right. Yeah, because he's supposed like, to be the the interlocutor between the child and the world. He's supposed to be that that barrier that that is permeable. And in some in some cases, the the father figure has to be show the child a little bit of what the world is actually like. And sometimes that means being unpleasant, and and it's a necessary um, condition. For 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 being a father, it's it's just the degree to which we've gone away from the archetypal guys. I know, but this guy I think gets to your point. The archetypal male fatherly figures, ironically enough, are the two great antiheroes, Clint Eastwood and Charles Bronson. Mm. Both in all of their movies, even though I don't think Bronson was in a lot of very good movies, mm -hmm. I think both of them exhibited that this world is kind of terrible. You're going to have to, you know, it's not going to be easy. You're going to have to make your compromises along the way, but we'll try to fucking make our way through it. That was kind of the attitude you got to take from both of those guys. Bruce Willis had a little bit of it, mm -hmm. and he's still kind of lingering around. It's not a surprise to me that Bruce Willis uh, remade <laughs> Death Wish. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, there are few and far between, and those guys are, I think the youngest of them must be in their 50s, if not more 60s. Yeah. Attitude. It's an older thing. Yeah, because it, th today's crop of uh, male figures in the popular imagination are all boys. They're all weaklings, you know, and and um, and, and they're portrayed as weaklings, and and they are they're portrayed as weaklings, and they cede the ground to the strong, independent woman who's taking charge, right? And and you never really believe these women, you know, because you know that at real crunch time they turn into a puddle on the floor. You know that, <laughs> you know it's 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 all just uh, 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 you know faints at being tough, you know. It's so weird, you know the the um, the old Tomb Raider movie with Angelina Jolie. You believed her, okay? It wasn't that long ago; it was about twenty years ago, right? Whereas the the current Tomb Raider, you don't. She looks like a real fictitious figure. Well, granted, Angelina Jolie is a better actress than uh, what's her name, the the one that they have. I don't even know who they cast. I can't even. <laughs> I, in fact, I even forgot that there was a new one. Yeah, uh, I don't think it was very successful. I don't know if it's come out yet or if it was not very successful. I, I, I don't know. I'll just let me look it up real quick. You know, we should do uh, like um, uh, 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 what should we call it? Um, an episode about this. Wait, has it come out yet? Uh, I suspect it hasn't. It did. Well, it came out in March fifteenth. In Ukraine. And oh, well, that's how it. That's how films open in the world. Yeah. Well, it's at, I'm I'm here in the Ukraine, and so it automatically tells the release date for here. Uh, no matter what switches I move, it's always you know, Ukrainian information. It's a miracle that I have this shit in English, right? Anyway, 
Okay. Uh, bo- worldwide box office was two hundred and seventy three million. Not very good. You know. Oh so, well, there you go. It was released, and I didn't even notice. Yeah. Well, that's the way of movies today. You know. But okay. So we've g- gone on loud shit, man. We've gone on like. Uh, yeah, we minutes. got on a little bit, hey, but you get the idea, everybody. Stuff happened this week. Yeah. Enjoy it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, and we we didn't touch on a whole bunch of stuff that did happen. Um, but uh, yeah, because like now the the latest Twitter thing that every the storm that's happening now is that everybody's pissed off that uh, Trump said that Robert E. Lee was a great general. That is Which objectively is true. true. It's it's not up for debate. It's and it's not racist to say so. It's like saying you know. Uh, uh, I don't know, you know, the, the, the Nazis were good at conquering France. Objectively true. That doesn't make me a Nazi. Oh, God. I, I, these people. So next yeah, week... You can objectively say that Zhukov, Marshal Zhukov, was a good general without being called a communist. No, you can't. You know, you're a commie. You, you, can, <laughs> you, you can also say that Rommel knew what he was doing. Oh, you're a Nazi desert. too? <laughs> well, you know, I've always, I've always been a commie Nazi. Yeah, That's a commie some, Nazi. Or a Nazbol, or a Nazbol as they... As they generally <laughs> say, so you know it's okay. Oh I, man, I, I for no, but actually, you know, uh, uh, seriously, we should do an episode on on uh, like masculine figures uh, yesterday, today, and tomorrow. You know that that would be an interesting podcast. Yeah, so we'll do something like that. Yeah, we could do that. Let's yeah. do that. Yeah. Okay. So anyway, uh, kind audience, thank you. We've tried your patience, I think, uh, a bit in this uh, edition of the weekly bile. But uh, yeah, it's been fun as always, and so. Should I leave you, Dr. Benway, with the final word? What, me too? Oh, <laughs> and that, ladies and gentlemen, is the final word of this week in the Week in Bile. Uh, thank you very much for listening to the Coach and Benway podcast, and we will catch you next time. Take it easy. Later.